Okay, so welcome everybody to the December uh, uh, Raleigh Astronomy Club indoor meeting. Um, I want to thank everyone who is uh, joining us uh, here today. Um, we've got a, a very packed uh, virtual room here, um, and we've got a great meeting um, for you this evening. Um, tonight, uh, our speaker is none other than our own uh, Ann Murphy, um, who is a longtime club member and currently co-chair. And she will be doing the talk uh, for um, uh, beginners to astronomy. This is gonna include uh, how to star hop, looking at the night sky, what type of equipment is available, and what is needed for a night under the stars. So if you wanna learn more about getting started in astronomy, then this is the talk for you. So we welcome all of you and I'll hand it over to Anne. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and uh, share my screen. I didn't realize that was, okay, we're on, um, okay. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. Is that a true statement? Whoops. Uh, yeah. No, no. Okay, wait a minute. Not sharing. I just, I did, I thought I did that and then I, I deleted out of it. Okay, wait a minute, hold it at this. Is it sharing at all? Oh, oh, I have to press the button. Never mind. I'm sorry. Okay. One more thing. Da, da, da. Okay. Um, so everyone can see it? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. It's looking yep. good. Okay. All right. And then um, during the presentation, uh, I do have some things that I normally hand out. Um, you know, obviously we can't do that. So I'm going to see if I can, you know, I I'll, I'll try to hold them up. To my picture, and uh, if you um, if you want if you need to see it bigger, um, let me know, and we will. Uh, I think you can do speaker view, and that makes the picture a little bigger. So, um, but anyway, so uh, good uh, good evening to everyone, and let me see if I can get get rid of this because I can't see what I'm doing. Okay. Here we go. Good evening. Um, I'm Anne Murphy. Of course, as Mike said, I am the Raleigh Astronomy Club co-chair, and I would like to get um, started on beginning astronomy. And so, um, so you might be thinking, hey, I love to get involved in astronomy as a hobby, but where do I start? Well, um, why take it up as a, as a hobby? Well, you want to see what's up in the night sky? Astronomy happens to be cutting-edge science. Um, it's immersive, real-world, and real-time. And it helps to make the leap from knowing to understanding. And it has a thrill of seeing the universe's wonder and a sense of accomplishments. So we have some questions that we want to ask, uh, and that you may be asking right now, asking yourself right now, and I hope to answer during this presentation. Um, should I buy a telescope? Uh, what kind of telescope? How can I learn to use it? Where should I do my viewing? Who can I ask for, for advice? And really the, the asking for advice, that is all of us. So we kind of work as a community and, and you can ask anyone for advice. Uh, what tools, books, and websites are best? And where can I join others with the same interests? And uh, this is a good first start uh, at the, for the Raleigh Astronomy Club. So um, we'll help you find out. And I hope to, you know, as we're going through this, uh, of course, if you have any questions as we're going through this, um, you'll notice that you're on mute. But if you could use the chat box, we have several people monitoring it, and I will stop uh, at various places. And, of course, if, if there are lots of questions, you can stop me. Um, either Steve or Mike can stop me as well. So we'll help you find out. And here we go on our thing here. So we have the night sky. So really, what can you see up there? What are the different things? Well, the big thing is the moon. Oops. Oh, here it is. Okay. So the big thing is like the moon. That is actually a very um, predominant thing to see. There's Saturn. And of course, right now, um, obviously, this is not a, a current picture because right now you can see Saturn and Jupiter. And I believe, I believe that's happening on the 21st that it will be most prominent on the 21st. And um, you have planets and of course their moons. So Jupiter has 
four Galian moons that you can see. Um, it has more than that, but um, you have to have a very powerful telescope to see the smaller moons, but it has at least four that you can see um, with, you know, with a, a large, with a, uh, an amateur telescope. You can see nebula, stars, double stars, um, and star clusters, and of course, constellations, um, which is, includes Andromeda and our Milky Way and other galaxies, which Andromeda is one of them. So um, looking at that, um, what do I want to see? Well, as I alluded to, there are there is the moon uh, right here. We can have, uh, this is Jupiter, um, other planets and comets, and this is Saturn. This is the sun, of course. Um, those of you uh, never look at the sun. I want to put. I want to point that out. Hopefully, everybody knows that. But don't look at the sun directly. You need to have a filter, a special solar fil filter, to make sure that you, um, you know, get rid of a lot of the glare, so you don't hurt your eyes. And then, of course, this is a comet right here, so you can <clears throat> so you can see that. Um, other things that you can see. So those are kind of like the, the non-deep sky objects, but we can also see deep sky objects. Now this, um, hopefully uh, people know about the Pleiades. So this is the Pleiades right here. And, um, and of course you can see uh, you know, star clusters and we have uh, two galaxies that you can look at as well. Um, and you can actually see these through um, amateur telescopes. Um, you might not get all of the color, but you can definitely you know, see a lot of this through amateur telescopes. Um, and so the next thing that you wanna do is you want to be able to find these things in the sky. So the first thing is a planisphere. And I happen to have one. Um, let's see if I can see it. Ah, here we go. Wow, this isn't gonna work very much, is it? But as you can see, let me put this here. This might not, that might not go well for, uh, for presentation, but as you can see, there's, there's a thing called a planisphere and it turns around and you put it on the, the date and the time that you want. And you can see all of the different constellations on there. Now, some of the planispheres um, have the, um, uh, you have other objects such as planets, actual planets on there as well. So you know that the planets move a lot more. So um, you kind of want to be able to, you know, they give you some hints as to how to, how to, find them. And then of course they have the North star, which is the grommet here. And that's, that's the North star. So what you really want to do is when you're looking at this, you, you take this and you want to look at it like upside down so that you, you know, so that, that things match. Um, so that, you know, when you're looking at the, um, uh, you know, looking at the big dipper on the planisphere, you're matching it to the sky itself. So um, that's kind of there. Does anyone have any questions on planispheres? Okay. Um, so the next thing that you might want to do is also measure the night sky. Now you don't even have really fancy equipment to measure things in the night sky. So as you know, um, or you may not know, is that um, what they do is you measure things in degrees. So you have 360 degrees, you know, a whole circle, of the night sky and you know you, you only can see um, to the horizon so you actually do have things below the horizon um, but but you want to see things uh, in de degrees and in order to do that uh, you can use you can determine use your hand to determine the, dis the distances in the sky and so um, between different things so really what you do is you hold out your hand like this and you can see that your pinky is, is about one degree. Now you might wanna ask yourself, hey, what if I have a smaller hand? Or what if I have a bigger hand? Well, usually you have a bigger hand, you probably have a longer arm. And so it kind of washes out in the end. So, you know, when you have a, a smaller hand, you probably have a shorter arm, you know, you're a child and you have a shorter arm. So it kind of washes out in the end, but you can look and see um, about things and you can say, oh, well, this star, these stars are one degree separation or five degree separation. Um, and then of course you have a, a fist, which is about 10 degrees and 15 degrees if you have the two fingers and uh, 25 if you have the, the two fingers like this. So, um, 
Why is that useful? If you're, uh, it's useful sort of with the, the star hopping. I'll, I'll kind of go in the next, the, the next slide. But here we're looking at the moon. As you can see, it's about as wide as your, your finger. So it's about um, a one degree uh, separation uh, that the moon has. And of course, it's not, it's not perfect. It's not exact, but you can kind of see things, you know, estimated. Um, so you have that. Now, if you wanted to, um, what, when this comes in handy is if you're measuring between the um, pointer star here, which this is the Big Dipper. If you have your Big Dipper and then you have these two pointer stars and you want to find Polaris. Well, really, Polaris and this pointer star is about 25 degrees apart. And so you can hold out your hand. Um, and see, oh yeah, that's about, well, it's a little bit more than 25 degrees, but you can see it's about that much apart. And so it helps you to find some of the stars that way as well. Um, just uh, some tools in the toolbox. We have that. Uh, so that's measuring the night sky. And this is a segue into star hopping. So star hopping, what that means is you start out with a constellation that you, that you know. And usually that's the Big Dipper. Um, you might know, you know, uh, Cassiopeia, or you might know another constellation and say, hey, I can find this constellation. I know where it is. Well, you might not know where the other constellations are or what they look like or be it. Well, you know what they look like, but you, don't, you can't see them in the sky. Well, you can star hop. You know what constellations are around the Big Dipper or what constellations are around Cassiopeia. So, Really, um, this is this is what this is doing here. So you you've got this constellation here, Cassiopeia, and you're doing a star hop to the Andromeda Galaxy, and so you can kind of see how that is. And you know, and of course, you know, obviously, when you're looking at the night sky, you don't have these nice lines. <laughs> but um, if you know at least one constellation, you can kind of hop around the sky and find at least um, uh, at least some of the, the bigger stars and also the other constellations. You might even be able to find smaller stars as well, um, depending on, on what they are. But this, that's the, the way with star hopping. Does anyone have any questions about star hopping or, um, you know, uh, finding the distances in the sky? No, no questions? Okay. Well, and if you have questions at the end, we'll, we'll unmute everybody or you can unmute yourselves and you can ask the questions as well. So um, the next thing that we're going to get into are binoculars. And so um, I actually have a pair. These are rather inexpensive that I use for our, our outreach. So it, it's been, been through a lot. Um, but these are, these are your binoculars. And they're actually two different types. There is the pro prism, which is a step binocular. And it's easier to handle. Um, it's not as powerful and it's less expensive. And then, of course, you had the roof prism, which is the eighth shot, which is what this one is. This is the of the roof prism. And um, this is, a, you know, an eight magnification by 32. So um, I'll kind of explain the aperture uh, and later on in things. But um, this is what this is right here. So um, let's see if there was any other. Any other notes with that? I think that was all I needed to say. Yeah, um, you know, basically the roof prisms are more expensive. You have a little bit more complex um, optics, but this one wasn't bad. I think I got it for fifty dollars at, at, at you know at the, uh, during Black Friday. So <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I got I got this. So it's just it's actually a very nice, you know, very nice pair of binoculars. So we had that. So that's the first thing. Um, you can, you know, if you feel like, hey, I don't want to invest in a telescope just yet because I don't know what I'm doing or I want to see. And we have some members, a member, uh, Frank, uh, has a, he has very good binoculars and he will show you um, after this whole, you know, once we start, you know, we can start being around people again. Um, you know, he'll show you he has a very good binocular setup. And so he is the, the guy to go to if you want to look at, you know, 
for different binoculars and how to set up. You can get, um, you know, you can get a mount for them so that they hold still and you can get larger, um, larger binoculars so you can see, um, you know, almost as well as, you know, as a, as a telescope. So um, those are the binoculars. Um, the next thing is selecting a telescope. So we have, um, you know, the different types of uh, telescopes. You want to, um, so as I alluded to before, um, we have, we have aperture, which is, uh, let's see if I can see this, which is the, which is, you know, how the diameter of your opening. And so these actually have the same, I think it's the same diameter on both sides, but, um, but you have some binoculars that don't, you know, they have bigger aperture than, um, you know, than where your eyepiece is or in, in telescopes, like, um, for instance, you know, this is your app, you know, you have your aperture here. So you, you know, when you have people talking about, Oh, I have an eight, eight inch scope or I have, whoops. Um, you know, have anything that you, you have, um, they will tell you that. So they're talking about the aperture. And of course you have magnification. Now the magnification is not, I don't think it's as important as aperture um, just because you can change the magnification using your eyepieces. Um, so you can switch out, you know, with different, different types of eyepieces, uh, you know, have more magnification or less magnification. And, but the aperture doesn't really change on your, at least on your telescope, it does not, or your binoculars, you have your, your aperture. Um, and really, uh, it's better to have a small, low power, but bright and well-resolved image is better than a, a large, high power image that is dim and poorly resolved. So, you know, so you really want to, you know, keep in mind about your aperture, I think. And really, when you're looking at a telescope, you, you know, you can have like a basic telescope and for your entire life and you'll be quite happy with it. And, and quality matters. Um, so it's better to get... Um, you know, obviously, you, you know, you might not want to afford a top of a line, obviously, but you want to have more than, well, a Kmart telescope, um, you know, that you want to have a step up at least. Um, and, and we've had uh, various, uh, um, we have various uh, 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 things on our website to kind of, uh, you know, wikis on our website to point to you know, what types of telescopes you're looking at. But there are different types. So we have, uh, you know, different ones. So the first one is a refractor. So this is a refractor here. Actually, I think I have these. Yes, here we go. And, um, oh, here's my refractor. Um, so I do have, actually, um, a very tiny refractor. And uh, so this one is actually really cool. Um, I haven't quite got the hang of actually looking through through it and that sort of thing. But you can see um, you, you you start at the very top. So in other words, you have your, your eyepiece that is at one end and then your 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 opening is at the other. And um, it doesn't have any mirrors. So this is a, the difference between a reflector and a refractor. Um, and it's good for planetary and lunar observing. And generally, they're compact and rugged. Um, obviously, they don't have to be as small as the one I just showed you. They could be, you know, something like this. And they're uh, um, affordable um, starter map models, and they're, but they're expensive for larger apertures. So when you get into that. And then the next one would be, um, the next telescope is a reflector, uh, which is a Newtonian. And it uses mirrors. The eyepiece is at the front. So you can see the eyepiece here. Um, at the front there, and it can use a tripod or that's only a mount. And I will show you the different ones. This is the tripod and you have more aperture for the price. And you can see here, this is a go-to. So what that means is this is a little computer and you calibrate it. Um, and then you can you know say, hey, I wanna look at Saturn or I wanna look at uh, Andromeda Galaxy. And you, you press it in there and it'll point to that particular object that you want to that you want to find, um, so you know you you obviously can do this manually, but I'm just showing you also that there are things called go tos, and that's that's what that is. Um, the next one is also a re reflector, and but this is Dobsonian mount. So this the, what they're talking about is right here the Dobsonian mount. Um, these are very simple to use. 
and um, um, they're, they can be bulky, obviously. If you look at this, this is pretty bulky, um, but they're affordable starter models. And so you can have that. And then the last one is um, a compound. And this is a combination of mirrors and lenses. The eyepiece is at the rear and it uses a tripod and it's compact for aperture size. So we have that. Um, so these are your different telescopes and your different binoculars. Does anyone have any questions or comments on that? Okay. So just to give you a um, look at how things are, are uh, look at through the different uh, types of telescope, we have image orientation. And so the original image, um, and this is through binoculars, looks like this. And um, the refractor in a compound would look like this. And really, when you're looking at stars, it doesn't matter. But if you're looking at planets, um, <laughs> yeah, it will it will get things turned around. So, you know, sometimes north is south and south is north. Um, you know, especially if you have a reflector, um, it'll be upside down. So, um, uh, you know, so we had the different the different types of orientation. But for the stars, it doesn't matter. I mean, you you won't see any kind of a difference. But for for planets, you will. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about, we've gone through the telescopes and the binoculars. Uh, we want to look at the eyepieces. So as I alluded to, eyepieces help you with, well, they help you with filters, and they also help you with um, magnification. So um, just looking at the different, oh, well, okay. And um, uh, most telescopes are, are, that are sold only have one eyepiece, so you, but you just need a few, um, a few of the decent types of eyepieces. And, you know, they're, they're basically there aren't, that many different kinds, except that they're the magnification, and then also uh, sometimes you'll have you'll have different filters as well. Um, so these are the eyepieces here. Now the next thing is the mounts, and um, so we have two: the A A L T uh, A Z mount and the equatorial mount. And this is basically all this is is is, is describing the type of mount that your telescope is sitting on. And so, um, you know, we have the different kinds here. And um, so uh, the, the ALT ones, really, it's affordable and it, it tracks on two axes. And um, the, the second one is like the Dobsonian. So this is the Dobsonian and, and this is the regular ALT. Um, and then we have the equatorial mount. Um, this one is more expensive and it must be aligned. And it tracks, it follows the track of the earth on the one axis. So that's the difference between the two of them. So, uh, Anne, we've got a question um, that came in. Um, uh, what is the advantage of a DOV mount over a regular mount? And I'm, I'm happy to, to weigh in if you'd like. You may go go ahead. I can yep. give you a layperson's, but I'm not <laughs> sure if there's like a, a big advantage, at least from my point of view. So yeah. So I think when when you look at a Dobsonian mount versus, let's say, a regular tripod, and in fact, a lot of times tripods will come with more advanced features, um, like you know, extra special gears to be able to do slow rotations, uh, and you can also motorize it. So when you think about your first telescope or the amount of money you want to put uh, towards purchasing a telescope, um, more of that money is going to go towards the mechanicals that are part of a regular tripod and mount versus a Dobsonian. A Dobsonian tends to be pretty simple. It's wood. Mm -hmm. You've got some Teflon bearings. You've got some screws. Most of your money is going to the optics. So if you have... $400 to spend and you know you're going to put if you buy a $400 let's say ref reflector on an equatorial mount versus a $400 Dobsonian you're going to get a most likely a bigger mirror with the Dobsonian for that same 400 uh, or uh, you're going to get a higher uh, quality um, uh, mirror in that case so that's the advantage of the Dob over the regular mount but at the same time if you want to be able to 
track, as Anne said, the motions very easily. So once you have an equatorial mount um, polar aligned, so in other words, it's, it's aligned correctly so that the rotation that you'll experience in the sky is the same that the way the earth is rotating is like a clock drive. All you've got to do is turn one, one basically handle or have one motor going and it's going to follow that object throughout uh, the night, assuming you've got a decent mount and, and you've got good alignment versus um, an alt as a manual or a dob, you've got to push that thing the entire time. So if you've got one, a high powered, um, you know, close up view of uh, the conjunction coming up, they're going to, you're going to see them kind of move in and out of your field of view very quickly. And so you're constantly kind of nudging the telescope to keep up. So each of them has their own pros and cons. So um, I think, in, in, and that's really, you'll find that throughout <laughs> the, the hobby. There's not one single best way of doing thing. There's not one, um, you know, perfect telescope. Everything is a compromise based upon your specific needs, your budget, and your goals. And, and a lot of the yeah. Sonians have been... Oh, I'm, good. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So just one other extra point on the Dobsonian, and, and literally your setup on the Dobsonian is so simple. It's usually yeah. just like 30, 30 to 60 seconds from car to ground, and you're ready to point and shoot. So that's the real, that's also one of the great advantages. I may have missed that in, in what you had to say, Mike, but it's no, so easy. You got it. Um, and... Uh, you know, the others will, will like, especially um, with a, with an equatorial mount, the setup's a lot more complex. And if you're new at it, you could waste an entire evening trying to get a, an equatorial mount set up. So, it's, you know, what do you want to do? If you really want to look at stars and you really, or, or some of the really interesting night sky objects, you might want to think about a Dobsonian just from the setup standpoint. But like Mike said, you know, the point is then you've got to kind of look at a star map swing it over, find the star, uh, and hop over to the object. It's not hard to do. It's pretty easy to learn how to do that. But just saying it, as Mike and Anna pointed out, that, that the uh, it is more of a manual operation. But it is very simple. It's the simplest scope to set up. Okay. And then also people have made their own Dubsonians. So um, I don't know if that, if that interests anyone, but they're so simple that you could, you know, you could make your own and, and, and people have done that as well. So, okay. Um, so are there any other questions? I'll move on. Okay. So the next thing is the finder scopes. And what this is, um, is your, your, it, it, the tele your telescope will have such a narrow view, it's going to be impossible to find a, a certain star or, or whatever, or you may have, you know, you may find it and it may just be sheer luck that you find it. Um, in order to help you with that, they had the finder scopes which have a larger point of view and 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 a some of them have crosshairs so that you, know, you put in the crosshairs and then all you need to do is, you know, you, you, you found your star so you can look through your telescope but, but it's easier to find that star and put it in the crosshairs if you're looking through a finder scope. So there are two different types. Um, so we have the uh, achromatic and the reflective sight. And so the achromatic magnifies, but it reverses or inverts the image. It works similar to, as a telescope, but it's much smaller and it uses lenses to magnify. But because they also use lenses, they produce an image that is upside down. So you know, just to, just so that you're not um, kind of weirded out because your image is upside down, um, it will it will do that. Um, and you can fix uh, fix by reading the star chart or the map upside down. So you can do that as well um, there. So the next one is, of course, the reflective sight. Um, this one does not use lenses to magnify the view. There's no magnification, and it does not provide does not produce an inverted image. And so those are just, you know, the, the two different types. Um, I have seen a lot more of these um, than I have of the reflective sites. Um, actually, I didn't know anything about them until I started researching for this uh, particular topic. So um, so this one is more, uh, more in use. So those are the, the two different types of finder scopes. Um, and so with that, that's like most of your equipment. Yes. And so the next thing is looking at 
you putting it all together. So <clears throat> really what telescope is right for me? Um, well, what the recommendation is, is maybe try a pair of binoculars and a planisphere first, just to kind of get your bearings. Um, join an astronomy club and go to an actual observing site, um, you know, where you can ask questions. People have their telescopes. They will tell you all about their telescopes and what you can find and you can see the different images that they can find. And some clubs, including ours, uh, have loner scope programs. So we actually do have a loner scope program, which I believe is still active, even though we have COVID. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Does anyone, know? it's it's still somewhat active, right? And if, if somebody wanted to, yeah. or we yeah. shut down due to COVID. Where it's, Case by case scenario, if we can make a an exchange um, in a social distant manner, then we, okay, you know, then we and, can do and we have availability, which is right. the number one problem right now. Uh, but yes, <laughs> and then also, but but unfortunately, our our loner scope program is only within uh, Wake County um, due to the fact that um, sometimes our scopes don't. It, it's really it's it's. It's easy to, to get them lended out, but then to get them back home again is, is, a, is a difficult thing. So um, even though our, 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 uh, our, our TELS or the Raleigh Astronomy Club has a, a wider range, um, you know, and some people are actually in different states, so we definitely can't use a <laughs> scope program in different states. Um, but we, we're, we're limited that to, you know, you have to be a member of the Raleigh Astronomy Club and you have to be within um, Wake County. Um, there may be exceptions, but for the most part, that's what it is. And um, you can determine what is important to you. So you can see, um, you know, do I want affordability or do you want quality? So, you, you know, you can spend a lot of money on the, on the, you know, on the hobby, but you may want to start out, you know, just to see what the quality is. You also want to see the handling and storage. So, you know, if you have something that's too big, and you're trying to drag it out, it's going to sit in your closet because you're like, well, I can't drag it out. <laughs> it's just too much work. But, um, you know, so depending on, on what you, what you want to do. Uh, so, and then also looking at the um, other people's telescopes can kind of give you a feel for what the other telescopes are like. Does anyone have any questions so far? So the next thing that we're going to talk about is planning your viewing. So, um, I know I've gone out a lot of times. I've gone to the Raleigh, uh, the, the Rack Ops. We have a Rack Ops, which is our observing night. Um, and this is, of course, before COVID. And I didn't really have a plan together. <laughs> I kind of went out there. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready. And um, But then you don't end up observing anything or you observe very few things. So it's helpful if you have planning just because, you know, some of the stars and the planets and whatever else you want to look in the sky, uh, comets and such, uh, the rise and set at different times so that, you know, you know, you know what you're looking for. And then also it, the sky, of course, is different depending on uh, whether it's spring, whether it's summer, whether it's fall or winter. So um, you can you can go ahead and, and make a little bit of a plan and then you can, you know, your time isn't wasted so much. So um, you can decide what you want to look at, uh, whether moon or planets, deep sky objects, the galaxy nebulas or star clusters. And then as I alluded to before, you know, find out the date and time of when these things uh, rise and set. And so you can either use a planet sphere or you can use planning software. So those are the two things there. So we have out in the field, um, so these are kind of some of the things that you need if you're out in the field. Um, it's not so, you don't need to plan so much if, if, you're, if you're going out in your driveway, which is what we're actually doing a lot of now. Um, <laughs> so after COVID, we'll be, you know, going to, uh, we, we've actually had in the, in the past uh, different star parties that people would go to. Uh, of course, we had rack ups um, every month. If we don't get rained out, we have rack ups every month. And then we also have, um, uh, you know, different observing events uh, that has. So when you're on the field, uh, you want to make sure that you have bug spray in the summer, just so that you're not eaten alive. And you want to uh, dress for the temperatures. So 
um, when you're dressing for the temperature, uh, you know, since this is a very, um, you're very still, uh, not a great deal of, of activity, um, it will get cooler. So you want to dress for the temperatures like it's 20 degrees cooler. Um, and this is especially true in the winter and late fall and early spring. Um, definitely uh, 20 degrees cooler. Um, I've noticed that in, because we are in the South, uh, summer, there's no problem. I mean, you know, I'm liking it. It's cooler. <laughs> yeah, you're not so, it's not so hot. But you want to do that. And then, um, so that's the dressing of it. Uh, you want to take care with your car lights. So um, if you go someplace, um, just be um, aware of your car lights and park in a certain way so that you know, you're not shining your lights on people. Um, so just to let you know, I mean, it takes a while. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes to get your eyes to get truly dark adapted. And so that's why the car lights are so important. You also need to have... Um, um, like uh, a lens on your, on your, uh, oh, what do you call it? On your flashlight uh, so that it's red. Um, just because your eyes can see, it, it, you don't get so, um, it, it doesn't, sh you know, mess up your eyes as much uh, to see the red during the, during the night. So, you, you know, you, you can, you can do that. And um, I have, let's see if I have this. I have, and I've got the, oh, well, here we go. Okay. So you can also use something like this. See, I have a flashlight, and it has, it has that pink, you know, so it kind of has the red, and, um, well, this looks bright, but in the nighttime, it looks a little better. Um, you know, it's not as bright, and, and it, it shines in a reddish tinge, so you don't have the bright light. Um, you also, if you're going to, if you're going to stay out um, really late, uh, you want to bring snacks or drinks, you know, if you feel like if you're the type of person that, hey, I'm going to get hungry, um, you know, you can you can do that just so that um, in case you're um, in case you're out there for a long time and you're getting hungry, you're you're like, oh, I have to go home because I'm hungry. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you want to go home when you, you want to go home. You don't want to, you know, so if you can if you can kind of plan for that um, and then. At dusk, before the sun actually all sets and everything, that's when you want to tune your telescope. So you know if you have the different you know the different types of your your things, you're you're going to get that um, together so that you can tune your that telescope. Um, you can do that at dusk. So that's really out in the field. Um, and and if I can uh, okay. make also one of suggestion. So um, okay. our friends over at Moorhead Planetarium uh, taught me this trick. Um, red latex balloons oh, yeah. stretch them over the front of, uh, of a smaller flashlight and probably put two on them and it works pretty well. And um, yeah, so that, and, and they, they do that um, just because the little kids, they love flashlights, you know, <laughs> they must have their flashlights, even though it's, it's pretty, it's pretty light out, especially if, if the moon's like half full or something like that. It's, it's actually pretty light, but they must have flashlights. Um, so yeah, if you put like a red latex balloon, that will do the same thing um, as well. So, okay. Um, so um, other equipment. So kind of the last slide was like the basic equipment. Um, there can be other equipment. Now, obviously you don't have like, you don't need like all this equipment, but if you want to have a work table for your charts, um, eyepiece case, et cetera, you know, any, um, any star charts that you have, anything that you, you want to have, you can have a work table. So, you know, just like a regular, um, one of those folding tables, you can put that out there and that'll keep everything organized so that you're not fumbling too much in the dark. Um, but when you're getting started, I don't think people are going to switch too much on their lenses, but, but you may, um, you know, definitely when you're getting better at um, observing things, you will switch on. And depending on what you observe, you want to switch on your lenses. You want to observe your chair. That is most important. Um, I, you know, you want to have an observer chair. You can go to, um, uh, you know, to a hunting and fishing place uh, and get one of those uh, uh, camping chairs. You, know, you want to have something that will kind of lean back so that you can see a little bit if you're if you're looking at comets 
looking for comets or meteors, um, you can you can lean back and see the entire sky, or you can pull it up a little bit. Beach chairs work well too, um, and you can pull it up a little bit and look through your your lens itself when you're looking through your telescope. Uh, you want red flashlights and headlamps. Uh, if you have a headlamp, just be aware that you know so you're not shining it in other people's eyes when you're talking to them. <laughs> and then um, we have uh, dew heaters for your telescope and a tripod for your binoculars. Um, so dew heaters are good. Uh, if you're going to be there more, if you're going to be there like less than two hours, uh, you probably, well, maybe maybe less than an hour, you probably don't need a dew, dew heater. But really, you it's sometimes the dew gets really, really bad. Um, and and your, you know, your, your telescope will dew up and you won't be able to see anything. You're like, why am I not being able to see anything? It's because of all the dew. Um, so the dew heaters work a lot. Um, we have various people have uh, solutions to these uh, dew heaters. And uh, we had that in there. So um, believe me, I've, I've seen uh, telescopes and I've, I've only been out like for a couple hours and, and it has it has made um, a difference. The dew has made a difference. So, okay. So any other questions for that? So, yeah, and oh, I'll, I'll jump in again and okay. just say um, with the dew heaters, um, yeah, in North Carolina, it's it's often a problem, uh, especially if you've got a night that you don't have a lot of wind. Uh, so the air is very still and your, your scope is going to basically radiate a lot of heat. And if you've got a scope that has a uh, glass lens in front, um, you know, a Schmidt Cassegrain, or uh, even a, a reflector, sorry, refractor, um, you want some kind of a dew shield in front of it that basically creates a pocket of air that stays a little bit warmer than the surrounding air. So you don't, you know, basically it doesn't hit the dew point and then all of a sudden all the moisture kind of, you know, basically condenses out of the atmosphere and just forms all over your glass. And um, that's what either a dew shield or a dew heater uh, will do to help um, keep your optics from uh, doing up and predominantly you want it on you know you want to take care of your primary mirrors um, or, or lenses um, up front um, but it also can present a problem with eyepieces so there are solutions to have little warmers or little bands you put on that run kind of just a little bit of heat uh, around the eyepieces to also keep them warm so um, you it's sorts of things that you'll experience as you start to experiment more in the hobby. And uh, all you need is a couple of ruined nights uh, of observing and packing up uh, early uh, to make you start to inquire, okay, how do I combat this? And, and that's also, you know, the, the, the other members of the Raleigh Astronomy Club, you know, we have all sorts of, everybody has a solution. Yeah, right. I think we got some feedback noise, but it's gone. Okay, so um, uh, so that's dew heaters. Uh, so the next thing I was going to have is a typical um observing sessions. So really, um, you know, once you've got your things, uh, well, this probably comes before you get everything together. Um, hey, so we have folks just. Double check that they're muted. Yeah, if you're muted, yeah. you can uh, you can go ahead and, and mute yourself unless you're speaking. Or, okay. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, so you want to pick a you want to have good weather and, and pick a clear night. So there are um, actually uh, uh, WRL. Um, believe it or not, I do go look at WRL. They, they have you know theirs is not half bad. Um, there is a uh, uh, underground.com. Uh, and then there's a clear.sky.com. And um, if, if you guys need to have, um, you know, some links, I didn't do this. I should have done this. I, uh, but uh, I, can, I can send you those links if you want to go uh, and, and, and copy me on, on email. Um, I can definitely go ahead and send you those links. Um, but we have uh, Clear Sky and it'll tell you if the sky is clear or if, uh, you know, if we're going to have clouds or how the seeing is. So sometimes you have a, a great deal of haze and, and you want to make sure that see what your seeing is. Um, 
Now, usually for rack arms, um, the, the uh, officers will look at these things and see, you know, do we have a good enough night that we can have a rack ops? And so you don't really have to worry so much. But if you're going out on your own, um, it's always a good idea uh, to look at that. And then you want to pick your observing site and get set up. You want to call them at your scope if needed and adjust your finder scopes and your, your scopes in general um, before, before you do that. Now, at deep twilight, you want to align your scope. Um, some scopes pull a line on the North Star. So these are go-tos. If you have a go-to scope, uh, you can pull a line on the North Stars. Other may use two stars in the sky. So these are, if you have a go-to and you, you know, you, you just have to read the instructions on that and, uh, and they will, they will be pointing to. And obviously, if you have a manual scope, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then you can uh, tour, tour the objects that you wish to see. Now, the next thing is um, observing sites. So we have, we have some, you know, some talks, some talks about observing sites. Um, and, and we've had some observing sites um, uh, talked about in the uh, listserv. But uh, some convenient site is maybe your, your yard or your driveway. Um, there might be lights from neighbors, so that might be a problem. Um, your viewable sky might be obstructed by trees. Um, but it does offer you the easiest setup, and if something goes wrong or if um, you need to be pulled away, you don't have to, you know, worry about driving all the way back home and dealing with whatever you need to deal with. So those are those are observing sites. However, um, there are some some parks and campgrounds. So Mirdot Mountain um, and Pettigrew, uh, you know, those are some parks and campgrounds. I don't know what their um, what their conditions are for COVID. That's the only thing because you. So this is going to apply for COVID as well. But you want to check on your after hour access and light control. And then of course there's um, other campers that may affect your observing. But you don't want to like kind of go off to the side of the road and figure out, you know, like in the middle of nowhere and 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 try to observe. <laughs> So you, you kind of want to go someplace that um, people know where you are, you know, and at least there's there's somebody if you get into into problems. Um, but the best solution is to join an observe uh, observer, astronomy club. Um, most have a safe, secure observing sites. In fact, the Raleigh Astronomy Club does. Um, we have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, Big Woods over by uh, Lake, not Lake Johnson. Um you big. Tell me, tell me again. Um, we have Jordan. Jordan, thank you. Um, <laughs> I need to start with a J. I'm like, what am I doing here? So Lake Jordan, we have um, Big Woods at Lake Jordan. Um, you know, we have the rack ops as I alluded to before, once a month. Um, and then uh, after COVID or before COVID, um, we also had, uh, you know, people would go out there spontaneously and you know there are course rules or whatever but um but you could go out there you know more than once a month um, we had had that and it's always safer to observe with others um so we have uh the raleigh astronomy club of course and then there's a there's chaos if you live near chapel hill this is a chapel hill Ast astronomical and observational society um these are local clubs and then also um and NCSU also has um, a local club as well. So um, we had that. Um, so those are what we have for the um, observing sites. Does anyone have any questions with that? Okay. So the next thing is observing programs. So if you're the type of person that needs a little more structure <laughs> in their observing, you know, like you said, oh, well, I don't know what to, to look at. I know there's the moon, there's Jupiter, there's the Andromeda galaxy, but what else is out there? Well, we belong to something called the Astronomical League, which is um, a whole bunch of other different clubs uh, that make up the Astronomical League. And Doug Lively will be giving a little bit of a, a talk um, a, a quick five second, you know, kind of explanation um, with that during the business meeting. Um, but the Astronomy League and has these observing programs. So they have like different types that you can do so that you'll know, oh, well, what kind of stars am I looking at? When are they out? 
you know, that sort of thing. And we also have, um, the Raleigh Astronomy Club also has um, observing programs as well. So we have like different ones as well. So um, those are observing programs. And um, thanks, and we look forward to seeing you. So uh, let me know if you have any last minute questions before we break for um, our break. So, uh, Anne, I, I will say uh, I do have to put a plug in for one of uh, the Raleigh Astronomy Club observing uh, programs okay. licensed uh, by the actual creator uh, of the program. It's called the Star Trek Observing List. Right, These are know. all objects that um, are mentioned in one or several of the Star Trek episodes that are based on real um, objects in the sky. And I think there's either 30 or 50 uh, on there. And that was uh, created many years ago by a 14 year old girl. And I can't remember from what club, uh, but she has allowed us to use that, uh, that list that she created. Okay. All right. Well, then that, uh, that sounds good. Um, does anyone else have any questions before we, we break? Then you might want to, might want to discuss. I don't see any comments in the Facebook feed, and I think we've either asked or addressed all the questions from the chat session. Um, and uh, if I could, I'd want to leave some some folks with just a bit of a teaser, uh, especially people new to astronomy. One of the things that we'll be talking, and maybe first, so we don't keep everyone too too long, uh, we'll be talking about a uh, the mentorship program that the Raleigh Astronomy Club is about to start. Um, so for those of you um, looking to get started and really don't have a good idea of where to get started or would like that additional guidance, um, we'll be talking you know, real briefly about what that will look like uh, right after the break. Now let me just uh, also interject one question that, that was about IP cleaning. I'm, uh, Jordan, I saw you put that in there. If, if you look at what Phyllis has put into the chat, she's got a great write-up on okay. on uh, cleaning your eyepieces and cleaning ah. the plates. So just just go there for the cleaning instructions. She's also got some great ideas on cleaning solutions to use. So uh, just make sure you pick that up out of the chat. Oh my goodness, we have like 44 chat people. And people have done 44 chats. All right, good. 